Thank you very much. Um, a, a warm thank you to the Hong Kong Housing Society for inviting me here today, and for Mr. Wal Walter Chan and his team for making us very, very welcome and sharing lots of experiences with us already. I've been very excited by the presentations already this morning. I've learned lots to bring home to the UK, and hopefully we can share some of our experience from the UK with you. It may be 10,000 kilometers to London um, from here, but we've got very similar ideas, very similar challenges, and similar to Hong Kong with Mr. Tan's presentations, we're doing very similar things. We might call it different. I might call it healthy and garden city, and you're calling it livable and sustainable, but we're all trying to achieve the same things, making it a livable place for the communities that we're working for in the future and the people who live in our, our homes. So I want to share with you this morning our experience of delivering a new town um, in, called Ebsleet, um, which is just outside London, um, sharing with your experience of trying to make it a healthy garden city. A garden city is a very specific type of development that we're trying to deliver. Um, in the 20 minutes, I want to get from the scale of that city and the town right through to the design of homes and intergenerational housing in particular. And for our finance colleagues, to give you a little bit of an insight as to the value, I think, that goes from looking at placemaking in a holistic perspective and thinking about the people that we live and work for from the beginning. So the context. Ebsleet is a new town, so it's a completely new development, um, 20 miles from the centre of London. It is arguably in one of the most strategic locations in the UK to build a new town. It's on the high-speed railway link between London and Paris, so it's 20 minutes back into central London, two hours to Paris and two hours to Brussels. So when the government built the new railway track from London to Paris, they built a new station just outside London with a view to building a new town in the future in that location. So it's in the right place. We also have good infrastructure. Um, the motorway that goes around London called M25 and other motorway connections are adjacent to us. And we're on the River Thames as part of the new Thames Estuary growth area. So good start. We're in the right location. We're sustainable we hope, and we can build on that connectivity to build a new place. We've got a high ambition for Ebbsfleet. Um, we actually are the first new town in the UK for 50 years. So in um, between the 1950s and to, uh, 1999, we built 32 new towns um, in the UK, but haven't started a completely new place since 1969 when we developed Milton Keynes. So it's a really new thing for us to look at a town um, in this context in the 21st century. We also have been working in our new time with the Health Authority. Um, I work for the Development Corporation. I'm sponsored by the Ministry of Housing, so we are funded by the central government. However, we work very closely with the private sector. We help the private sector by facilitating the infrastructure, but hope private sector development will come in and build the homes and the businesses of the future. We've also worked in our project with the Ministry of Health, because it's very important not just to think about housing, we need to think about jobs, we need to think about health, we need to think about all the things that make it livable and that people actually need in their place. So it's really important for government departments to work together and in partnership. So in Ebbsleet, we're very much looking at this idea of a 21st century garden city. We're also in brownfield land, which means it's been previously used for industrial use, um, hence why we've got a big site outside London that hasn't been built on already. It's because it's very difficult to build in that location. But within our location, there are existing communities. We really need to work and embrace those existing communities and make sure they benefit from new development and are not actually um, having all the problems with it but not actually getting anything from it. And really importantly, we call it today intergenerational, but we call it for everyone. I think if you build a town or a housing development for older people, you design it for everybody because if it's um, suitable for older people to live there, it's suitable for someone with a pram, it's suitable for families, it's suitable for everyone. So think about how to design for older people, we think about how to designing for everyone. And it's really important we share our lessons, both in the UK and to places like this today. So I'm really learning from you and hopefully you'll learn something from me. So this is the site that we're working from. It doesn't look like London, if you've seen images of London. Um, this is an edge of London site. It's former chalk quarries, so just outside London, in such a well-connected location, this was the, the center of the cement industry for the UK for over 100 years. So all of our land that we're developing has been quarried for 100 years, creating um, cement, which is then distributed all around the world. This is our city center of the future. <laughs> um, 
So this is, this is actually an international train station. So the government built an international train station, which is where you can see all the parking going towards, uh, with a view to building a new town. The land was actually all owned privately. So although the government built the train station, because the land was owned privately, the infrastructure costs were so significant that the development has not come forward. So the government set up myself and our team as a development corporation to try and facilitate bringing that private sector investment in. At the minute, the train company makes so much money from car parking, which is not sustainable at all, um, and therefore we need to turn this into a much sustainable, livable place. And in the foreground, you can actually see a lake, which will be our, one of our future city parks. Again, this lake is completely closed off for public use because it was a former quarry, it's very deep, it's very cold and very dangerous. We're also on the River Thames, so it's not just this, this brownfield quarry sites, we've got lots of old industrial land, and again, opening up that waterfront, we actually have six kilometers of the River Thames in our development that is inaccessible. It's unbelievable that six kilometers of the River Thames is cut off from the community, but we really need to open that back up. So to do that, we're going to deliver a new town over the next 15 years. That new town will have 15,000 homes for 40,000 people. We hope it will have 30,000 jobs and all the facilities for a new town in that location. To build the new town, there will be nine villages. So the different colours on the left-hand side image show the nine villages that we will build. Each village needs to be very similar to, to Mr Tan's example, walkable neighbourhoods within 10 or 15 minutes of a village centre and within a new public transit system that will run through all of the new nine villages. All of the villages will be separated by green space and we'll have seven new city parks so that 44% 40, of all of the area will remain green. So what have we achieved so far? So we're six years in. We've built 20% of the homes, so 3,000 homes have been completed and 7,000 people live there. We've built three primary schools, three community buildings, um, some pubs and shops and other things. Importantly, our first employment um, site has just opened, and it's a new modular construction factory for, for homes, for one of the most prestigious house builders in England called Barclay Homes, and they're going to build their homes in Ebbsfleet, really the sort of sign of the generation to come in this new place that we need to be looking to the future and to innovation. But very importantly, if I have one message from today, the most important thing is you need to work with the people who will live there. You need to work with the place and the people and make sure you're delivering what they want and what's going to help them have a better life in the future. So we've established a community board that will help shape that place and those people tell us what facilities they'd like to see in the new town and also how they'd like to get active in their communities. As a landmark approach, we've established a new Garden City Trust. So the Garden City Trust is a completely new model that was first piloted in, in the first garden city in Letchworth 100 years ago. It means that after we're finished as a development corporation in 15 years, the Garden City Trust will manage and own all of the community buildings and all of the green space and manage it for the benefit of the people who will live there in perpetuity. The board of the Garden City Trust will be managed by residents, so they will have a stake in their future city and place. So this is the first time we've done this in the UK for a long time, and that's because the private sector model currently is to service charge everyone who moves into a new place to live in that place, which we don't want to do in the future. We want to make this place that the benefit we realize from developing it is actually kept for the benefit of the people living there long term. So a healthy garden city, what do I mean by healthy? I think by healthy, we could say sustainable, we could say livable. Um, today, people are very conscious of their health. People are living much longer. Um, people are living in the UK much longer in poor health. So it's really important that we start thinking about how people live longer and live well in the place and live active lives for 80, 90, 100 years of the future. Now we're not starting from scratch here. The UK has got a good track record of building good new places. Um, three of our new planned communities in the UK are, are UNESCO World Heritage Sites, which means they're the best examples in history of having built planned new places. We have examples from the 18th century and the 19th century, including Edinburgh Newtown, Salter and New Lanark. All of these places are seen as being very philanthropic um, because the people who built them tended to be industrialists or developers. And the people who moved there had an instant improvement in quality of life. Moving from Bradford to Salter in 1846 improved your life expectancy by 50%. 
So that's how much the built environment can have and having good living opportunities can have on your life and opportunities moving forward. So we need to learn from these places. Also in the UK, as I said, we built 32 new towns, some of which have been quite disastrous, where we built only public housing and some of the health problems there are the worst in the country. So we need to learn from the best and avoid the worst. I mentioned garden cities. So Garden City was a principle that was developed by Ebenezer Hard, Howard at the end of the 19th century. And his view was very much about um, the best of the health, health, the town and the country. Um, so again, even 100 years ago, he was looking at health. And that's because many of the solutions for new planned communities are addressing existing problems in existing cities. His plan for Garden City is to relieve the congestion of Victorian London Many of you may have seen A Christmas Carol. Think A Christmas Carol and what it was like to live in that place. He was very worried about the conditions of people living in central London, so he came up with a new concept of a garden city. Move people out, move them and get the benefits of living in a town with access to jobs, but also the benefits of the country with access to green space. And it was economically viable because good placemaking brings value. The increased value of the land was enough to pay for the infrastructure in that place. So this was the model that we're trying to, to mimic in a 21st century version. In terms of healthy new towns, this is a very specific initiative that was developed by the National Health Service in England. Now, the National Health Service is probably one of the most proud elements of living in the UK. And interestingly, the, the National Health Service is 75 years old, also next month. So very similar to the Hong Kong Housing Society. It's probably not a coincidence because in the post-war years, when you were addressing the housing problems, the congestion of inner cities, the demolition, we founded the health service, we founded our housing department, we founded our planning system. So you founded the Hong Kong Housing Society. So addressing similar issues. Now in 1948, the Minister for Health was also the Minister for Housing because they realised the importance that housing and health had in working together. But I don't know what's happened here since, but in the UK we forgot about that. And for many years in between, there's been no connection between health and housing and no funding connection. So this programme in terms of healthy new towns was saying, actually, the health department, the health industry, would like to work with the building industry and the housing departments to think, if we invest in good placemaking, can we save the health service in the long term? Because actually, our health service we're very proud of, it's free to everyone, but with people living longer, and some living longer in poor health, we cannot sustain it. So we need people to be more self-sustaining, and we need to address that. So we've worked really with the health department to think about how we designed a healthy garden city. Uh, I was quite struck with Mr. Tan's presentation of hardware, software, and hardware, and it's probably similar to my three work streams in building a healthy garden city, where we're looking at the design of the built environment, the model of services to deliver to the people who live there, and really importantly, thinking about the people and how we community build in that place. So our Healthy New Pound program had, quite simply, five outcome drivers and three work streams. Now, the outcome drivers were really looking to the future. We want people to look after themselves. People want to look after themselves. People want to be healthier. We just need to think how we can help them, empower them, and enable them to live healthier lifestyles. And that's by creating a vibrant and inclusive place, giving them the opportunities for a better quality of life, giving them access to green and blue space, and thinking about the home from the beginning. Think about a home that someone can age well in place. People don't like to move, so the more homes that we can make that are sustainable and flexible for everybody, it means that people can stay in that home, and maybe multi-generational, but stay in the home that they can, and it can flex and adapt to their needs. I'm just going to pick out from our work streams a, a few examples of the initiatives that we've, we've picked out. Thinking about the built environment, we've thought about both the design of the home and the design of the neighbourhood. Now, we're looking at Ebbsfleet, it's quite a small project on the scale of your projects in Hong Kong, and we saw this morning 40,000 people is quite modest. But we're using Ebbsfleet as a pilot to test ideas that would be applicable for the rest of the country, for the rest of Kent, and nationally. So the health service is really looking to us to say, what can we learn from you that might help other developments in the country? Not just new towns, but also existing communities that might be regenerated as well. So we worked with the community to ask them, what do you value in your home? What are the important elements of a home for you that makes it livable? And actually, most of those things are free. Natural light, natural ventilation, um, access to outdoor space, 
space, <laughs> space to change, accessible. So, so quite simple things that it's safe, that it's secure, and actually that it's smart. So we could take some of the technologies that Mr. Tan shared and adopt into their houses in the future. So we developed a, a sort of definition of healthy homes, which we worked with our developers. And most of our developers said they'd be willing to take them on board free if the health service would badge their homes as healthy, because people will pay more to live in healthy homes, probably even more so than sustainable homes at the minute because they're very conscious of healthy. We also looked at the principles of healthy neighborhoods and our healthy neighborhood principles have now been adopted as a national standard called building for a healthy life that all new developments in the UK um, address. With the health service, we run an international design competition to design health into landscape. We had over 100 entries from all around the world. Um, the winning entry had over 500 million social media views. So it really shows the interest people have in the idea of healthier landscapes, healthier places. And for the health service, they were so astounded at how much interest there was in this from a modest investment from them that they got this sort of um, setting the scene for a long time. We'll probably spend 100 million or 1 billion Hong Kong dollars on parks. So having a competition that sets that level of ambition was a very modest starting point to, to, to shape a lot of future development. But as I said, most importantly to me is the people who will live there. We have really worked with the residents, and people say, you're building a new town, there's no one living there yet. But there's always people to engage with. There's ex existing communities nearby, they're the first people who move there, um, and we really can work with them to understand what they value in their community. Now, one of the problems with a new community, a new place, is it's very boring. We used to call it, um, in, in, in England, new town blues. But really, it was depression, it was social isolation. It was really feeling disconnected from your family, from your friends. So it's really important in a new development when you're building a new island. What's it going to be like for people when they arrive? How are they going to make family connections? How are they going to make friends? So we've done lots of initiatives that the health service has paid for to try and create community activity in the place. We offer small grants for people to trial things themselves. We give every resident a free Fitbit. We have an app that rewards people for walking and cycling. We've funded new growing gardens in every school. We've got new um, gardens within church halls and church schools where people grow food and then share it together through meals. Lots of these initiatives, some have worked better than others, but you need to test and you need to trial and you need to think about how people are living in the place from the beginning. Take Sylvia. Sylvia is one of the members of my community board. Her daughter moved to Ebbsfleet in the first stage of development. And this is what people think. Typically in a new town, young families move to a new town. But Sylvia came to visit her daughter in the new town and thought, I like this new town. And then she decided she would move from central London to be to her daughter. Her son then felt very isolated. He said, oh, I'm not staying here on my own. So he moved to this new town as well. So in our new town, we now have Sylvia living in a family home, her son living in an apartment, and her daughter living with her grandchildren in a house. But if the houses are designed for everybody, all generations can live in the same place. So moving on to thinking about intergenerational housing, we were very conscious in Ebbsfleet to think that you know, people think of young people moving to new towns, but actually even if it is younger people, they all age. So we need to think about how we design for an aging society. So our Healthy New Town was really important in bringing partnership working together. So from the local primary care providers, which are the GP providers, to our hospital, to our public health, all working together to think about what it would be like to live in this place. Um, so we came up with the idea of intergenerational housing. We didn't want people to be ghettoized. And we thought if we have to build a care home, we will probably failed because we should be having other options before then. We also had to think about what the primary and secondary health needs of 40,000 new people would be like. So we've come up with the concept of a new, gen a new neighborhood that's world-class, dementia-friendly. It includes our intergenerational housing community, some housing with care that's step-up, step-down housing between hospital and home, and the health and community services for the whole community of 40,000 people. As I said, really important that you work with your community, you work with the people who are gonna sh use these services. So we spent five years developing the brief. Five years of talking to people, working with the health services, working with all the partners to see what would they need to see in this building. This is a very complicated diagram, I'm just showing it because this is some of the, the process you have to go through to get a brief 
just for a new intergenerational community that's, that's addressing health needs today and for tomorrow and trying to be future-proofed in terms of reflecting how things will change. This building that we're developing will work at a city sub-regional scale for 250,000 people. It'll have facilities for the whole of Ebbsfleet for up to 50,000 people. And it'll also be the main community building for Ebbsfleet Central. That car park that I showed before will be transformed into this new development. Um, I'm not going to go into detail of the plan, but just give you a sense of how the complex building is forming out. What we're putting in this new health and well-being hub and intergenerational housing are the main community assets for the whole community. So the village hall, the town meeting place. We have a space for up to 450 people where we can train the health workers, but also could be used for ballroom dancing. You know, older people don't want to be wheeled into a space for lunch and wheeled back out again. They have an active, vibrant life. So in the center of this development, there is a gym, there is dance studios, there is the village hall, there's kitchens to teach people how to cook better and to eat better. And it also has a creche and a nursery. And it also has the GPs and urgent care, maternity services, child services, and this new intergenerational housing community. Looking through the section is the health and well-being hub at the core, but within the wings of the neighbourhood and connected is an intergenerational housing neighbourhood and a housing with care provision. All of it sits around the main village, the main town square for the whole of Ebbsleen. This is our concept of intergenerational housing. It's quite a complex diagram, so ho hopefully you'll get to look at this in more detail in the future. Effectively, what it's showing, though, is imagining the intergenerational housing as growing a tree. It's something we want to grow over time. The foundations and the roots of that tree are the people, the community, their needs. Um, as we grow this idea, what are the ways they would like to share? What are the activities they'd like to get involved in? Think about different housing types, different housing tenures, different people who might work complementary together, and let's grow a new proposition together for, through that. A baseline for our housing for older people is a, is, a, is a report called the HAPPY Report, very similar to your race course, but it's H-A-P-P-I, not Y. Um, <laughs> uh, the HAPPY Report, Jenny will also share in her presentation later. I, I used to have a role as um, head of strategy for the, the housing department, a bit like HKHS, um, and we actually, with government, set the, set the principles of specialist housing for older people. Again, not rocket science, the things that everybody would like to see in good homes. All housing in England for older people now follow the happy principles voluntarily, which is what we want to, want to achieve. In terms of rendered generational housing at Ebbsfleet, it will offer specialist housing for older people, but the demand that we've identified was for active older people, not people waiting till they're at a crisis point and have to move, but how can we make younger, older people who want to live in a different lifestyle setting, live in the city center, and be real contributors to the vibrancy of our new place. So we need to have really attractive housing that they would aspire to live in. And they don't want to be ghettoized. So we are looking at complementary other people who would like to live in the same community. Our hospital trust has identified health workers as being a particular problem. We have lots of international nurses and doctors moving to the area and they have nowhere to live. Um, so this could be a solution for them as well. Um, and we're also looking for a mixture of tenure. Some older people have the, have the most equity in their homes, over three trillion pounds of equity in the UK or an older person's housing. They're a brilliant market we should be targeting. You know, don't be afraid of saying, let's target the older market. Why are we always targeting the younger market? Um, so we need to try and come up with this concept of giving a very attractive proposition that has a mix of tenure and a mix of user and age groups. So our proposal at the minute is that 50% will be homes for sale for older people, 25% will be homes for affordable homes for older people where they can buy a stake in the home but also rent the rest of the stake, and also looking at 25% being for health workers or key workers to live in the same development. Our plan is for two vertical communities, two towers adjacent to the health and wellbeing hub but connected at the, at the podium level. Um, the, the, the vertical towers will be creating sort of vertical communities where on each floor, six dwellings will share the sort of core infrastructure, but every three floors, they'll share a winter garden and a workspace and studio space so that up to 25 residents or homes will actually share that winter garden space, which is the, the amount we know people feel comfortable getting to know that number of people. On a bigger level, at the top of the building and for the whole 
development of 138 homes, we'll have a roof terrace garden and we'll have a living room on the ground floor. But really the important thing for, for um, intergenerational living is, is thinking of the different scales and how people might want to interact. Because the interaction is really, really important for us, that mutual support that comes from intergenerational housing. We are looking at mixing those tenures. Now we will be working with the private sector to understand how much we can mix. The diagram I'm showing in the bottom left is for pepper potting. We might not go as far as pepper potting, which means it's blind between shared ownership, private for sale, health workers, but we could also separate it by floor or by neighborhood in terms of winter gardens. So we'll look at the different options for that, but we do know that that mixing is really important to the people who are gonna live there. And we're also providing some housing with care on the same site in, within the Health and Wellbeing Hub because our hospitals, and very typical of all hospitals in the UK, 30% of all beds at any one time are blocked by people who can go home, but their home isn't suitable for them to go home to. So this gives them a, a, a solution between home and the hospital where we have 69 beds um, in groups of nine or 10 because people feel quite comfortable in that group with shared living rooms and kitchens. All of it built around a central courtyard, thinking your beautiful cathedral cloisters or your nunneries and everyone in a very healthy space, every bedroom having a balcony looking out over the park of the future. So that's our vision, it isn't built yet. Um, um, hopefully we'll, we'll get there eventually. But just to conclude um, from the financial people in the room, um, we've done some research to try and prove the benefits of putting health, housing and social care together. This is actually the first development in the UK to propose health, housing and social care together. The building is one billion Hong Kong dollars. Um, we need funding from government to help us deliver that, but also for the private sector. So we need to prove the benefit that this has. So uh, I've listed some of the benefits here. Self-supporting mutual um, communities actually really reduce the call on the health service, um, social connectivity, busy people are healthy, people are happy people. You know, having things to do and places to go is really, really important. Um, there's real value in people uh, having improved health outcomes and a happy workforce is also really important. Now our, our, our research has shown in our building alone, the benefits are over seven million pounds per annum, but those benefits are the UK PLC not to the house builder or the person living there. So if the UK PLC want to realize those benefits, UK PLC have to work together. The housing department have to work with the health department, have to work with the business department. But if we do do that, we can really save benefits to the society as a whole. So that's my last message for you. And thank you again for sharing your lessons with me.